Oh, no. Oh, no. Thank you. I want to thank Chris over here for having me up and uh, for all of you having me here this afternoon. It's, uh, and John Lance for coming along and holding my hand through this whole thing. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here to speak with you all about my so-called career. Anyway, I want to just say that uh, at the beginning, I was like every other young man in the 60s, saw the Beatles on TV on a Sunday night on Ed Sullivan, and after that was hooked. And uh, of course, Ringo was, the, uh, was my hero for the, uh, the beginning of my life and everything. My mother had two boxes in the uh, garage for our new washer and dryer, and I soon made that into my first drum set. And that's, that's, that's how I started, listening to the Ventures and groups like that. And, uh, and got serious and took lessons uh, from uh, the guy that worked down at the Water and Light in my hometown of Hibbing, Minnesota. If any of you know about Hibbing, you know that Bob Dylan is from Hibbing. And of course, I can remember standing in Abe Zimmerman's uh, electric uh, appliance shop with my father and my dad buying a refrigerator from Bob Dylan's dad years ago. And uh, I, all the hippies that would come to go to work for Dylan's father in the summer for a, a day, just so that they could say that they worked for Bob Dylan's father. I never met Bobby. Uh, and my mother was friends with all the Jewish gals in town, so I heard all the stories about Bobby this and Bobby that, and, but I've never got to meet him. I knew his brother David fairly well, who uh, handles Bob's, uh, all Bob's business affairs and things like that. But that was the kind of place I was brought up. It was a real melting pot. Gino Pellucci, I don't know if you've heard of Gino's Pizza and stuff like that. Those people were from Hibbing. Uh, Kevin McHale was a famous uh, basketball player, people like that. It was, a, it was quite a town to be brought up in. And uh, you'd go to the guitar player's house and the people would be speaking Finnish, you know, all the grandparents. And you go to the other guitar player's house and they'd all be speaking Italian or Norwegian or, so, or uh, you know, Serbian or Croatian. So it was a real, quite the place to be brought up. Uh, you get a little, little bit of everybody in there. My father died when I was young, so our house became the hip spot in town to hang. And, of course, I had the drum set, so the hell with moving that thing around. Come on, we'll practice at my house. It was a lot easier that way. So anyway, off to the University of Minnesota. Studied for a while with a famous drummer there, Elliot Fine, that wrote one of the great drum books of all time. And uh, uh, decided early on that, uh, you know, I wanted to travel and see the world and play music for a living, or a so-called living, anyway. And uh, I began with uh, playing country music with friends of mine who are now in Branson, to, to tell you the truth. And uh, we decided uh, early on, if you're going to play any kind of music, whatever, you know, if you want to play jazz, there's one town to go to, and that's New York. If you want to get in the studios, there's any number of places you can go. Los Angeles, you know, Detroit, places that had studio scenes, or Nashville. And if you wanted to play country music, there was one town to go to, and that was Nashville, Tennessee. So my friend and I decided that, I think I was 20 at the town. I'm, I'm 64 now, so it's, I've been playing drums for 51 years, and I've been professional for 40. So uh, we decided if we're going to do it, we're going to go to Nashville and play. So we did. We, uh, we headed there with no money and everything, sold our blood so we could eat, 25 bucks a pint. They gave you... Uh, an orange crush after you, they took your pint of blood and they gave you your check for 25 and you took it across the street and they'd cash it for a dime and then we'd go down and get a bite to eat and so on and so forth. And we worked with many different groups around Nashville. We worked down on the famous uh, Broadway. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Lower Broad in Nashville, Tennessee, but it's a place where all the musicians uh, go to work and play and I did that for many years. And in the 1975, was lucky enough to score the gig with Kitty Wells, the queen of country music. It wasn't God that made honky-tonk angels, and it was uh, quite an experience working with people like that. They'd been on the road before the freeway system came into America. That's how long they'd been around, so, and would tell me all kinds of fantastic stories about working the Opry and having to get back on Saturday night in their cars with the bass fiddle attached to the top of the car, and and through the rain and all that. And, uh, you know, Johnny and Kitty were wonderful people, and it was a great experience. I toured Europe with them 
and got to Hawaii and stuff. And a lot more fun, actually, than the years with Eddie Rabbit, to tell you the truth. We went to a lot more interesting places all over Canada and here and there. So uh, and Kitty and Johnny, it was quite an experience. And I mentioned Johnny Wright of Johnny and Jack fame. They were a famous uh, duo in country music, kind of like the Lubin brothers, sort of only even before their time. And so it was, it was wonderful and it was a great education in country music to work with those people. And I did that for about two and a half years. And I heard through the grapevine, as all these things work out in the music business, that Eddie Rabbit was looking for a drummer. And I'm going to clear up one thing to begin with. When you hear Eddie Rabbit on the radio, it's not me on drums. <laughs> it's somebody else. Um, the way the system works in Nashville is uh, if you're not in with the producer, they're the ones that choose the musicians that work on the albums. And I wasn't in with any of Eddie's producers over the years, so they always use their own crew to record with. But I played every gig except one in 20 years with Eddie and was lucky enough uh, to go down that day that I heard about it and uh, do the audition. And I would think I was the last out of 12 or 15 guys. I was the last one in the door, and they walked down the hall of SIR in Nashville and said, you're the guy, do you want the gig? And at the time, it was less money, if you can believe that, than Kitty Wells was paying. So that was cheap. I was working for, for not too much. And uh, I took the cut and pay because I knew Eddie was going to happen. You know, he was, it was an exciting time. And when people ask me, what about all the times that you worked with Eddie. And I played some big, big gigs with him. I mean, 100,000 people. You know, I had my Ringo at Shea Stadium moment a couple of times with Eddie. You know, I mean, 50,000 people standing up to cheer and doing five encores that drive my life away. I mean, things like that that you, you never forget. I mean, wonderful, uh, wonderful things happened, you know, with Eddie. But the most fun was when I first started with him and you knew there was a buzz, you know, and you, and you knew that he was going to happen. And we were working small clubs, you know, we, the bottom line in New York, the Roxy in L.A., places like that that we, that we worked. And all the hip people had come out before he really had made it. You know, I got to meet Steve McQueen. People like that would come to these gigs, you know. It was like, you know, Steve McQueen, my boyhood hero, shaking my hand, saying, there's so much talent on that stage, I won't use the word. I can't believe it. Steve McQueen saying that to me, bullet, you know. I mean, it was unbelievable for me at that time, you know. Papillon, here he is talking to me, you know, shaking my hand and telling me that we have talent. Ron Wood from the Rolling Stones coming out to catch one of our gigs someplace. You know, Sly Stallone, people like that, you know. Paul Simon showing up at the gig in New York. I mean, you know, and this was way before Eddie had uh, any, like, real major success. But that was the fun time when you knew it was going to happen and all these people were coming out to see him and, uh, and that was when it was most exciting, nobody making any real money or anything. When it got into the concert thing, when you're there and it's 50,000 people and you're in the back stage area, there's an assault around and, you know, you walk with security up to the stage and there it is, a great big stadium full of people and you play the show and go home or hit the bus, or hit the hotel, whatever, but it wasn't nearly as fun as some stinky little smoky packed club full of people that were excited to be there to see this guy that I was backing up on stage. We had a great band, and it was a lot of fun. A lot of energy always in the room. Everybody in the band played their asses off. It was, it, I can't tell you what that means when you go in there and, and you just, you know, you kick a whole amount of butt, and you leave it smoking, and, and it was a lot of fun. And that was the fun years, was when that was happening. And uh, there can't, uh, you know, I can't say anything about the 100,000 people. That was a thrill, too, in a different kind of way and everything. But uh, in all those years, I got to work with all kinds of fun people. I know Wayne Carson was from this area, and uh, we worked a whole tour with Wayne one year. And what a character. Uh, does any, how many know knew Wayne? Oh, my God. All right. It's the Wayne Carson fan club we got going here. We did a tour out in... Uh, Oh, it was in Wyoming and Montana and Colorado and places like that. And Wayne was on the tour. And he, uh, we used to do a sound check, Eddie's band. We had a, we had a, Eddie never came to sound checks, which we loved. 
because then we didn't have to play the same damn songs we were going to play that night. So we got to do our own stuff, and we had a whole repertoire of things worked up. And amongst them, of course, was the letter, like Joe Cocker did it, you know, and, uh, and Wayne, of course, wrote that. And um, he comes on the show, and he's doing a solo, it's just him and a guitar. And, uh, and we're doing sound check one day, and we didn't just for kicks, you know, Wayne wasn't around, we didn't think, and we did the letter, and he loved it. So every night, <laughs> he'd, he'd get us up in the middle of his set, and, we'd, and he'd have me sing the letter, because I, I was the guy that sang it, so. And he was, uh, he was quite a character, he was a great guy, we had a lot of fun with him on tour that year. We were in, I think it was Missoula, Montana, and we're on the bus, and we decided to go jam. And uh, so we're, the only place to jam is a biker bar. So we pull up into this biker bar, and there must be, I don't know, 50 Harley Davidsons out front, you know. And we're getting out of the bus. We pull up in this huge bus, and Wayne's there with me. And I'm getting off the bus, stepping down, looking up, and he says, come on. He goes, hey, he's looking out. This place is kind of a, kind of a dump, but pretty rough looking. And he says, you think we're going to be all right? <laughs> and, of course, Wayne had had a few, I suppose. And uh, he, was, he was awfully nervous. We went in, they loved us, we sat in with the band, Wayne did the letter, it went over, it was a, it was a smash, he had a lot of fun, he was a great guy, and I'm, I'm sorry he's gone, he was quite a character, and we, we had a, what a great songwriter, and great fella, it was a heck of an experience along with Wayne there, and everything. But getting back to, uh, to all the, the traveling and the, all that, and, and not being on the records, and all that. Nonetheless, we uh, uh, there's a, if you go to YouTube, you can catch Eddie's performances, and you can see me back there. And a, a lot of the, the stuff actually sounds fairly decent. I'm surprised sometime that uh, that it sounds as good as it did because we were all out of ourselves a little bit during a lot of those years and stuff like that. So I'm surprised that it came across as well as it did. But uh, all in all, it was a it was a great time of my life. Uh, Eddie passed away, unfortunately, from cancer in 1998, and uh, that was the end of it. I'd been with him for 20 years as his band leader and, uh, and drummer, and uh, I, I miss him to this day. He was a, he was a great fella, and uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't think he's gotten the credit uh, that should have gone to a, as good a singer and songwriter as he was all those hit records and stuff like that, and uh, it, was, it was an exciting time. He was the first guy in Nashville, really, to use, uh, like, rock players in a country, in a country setting, you know. We, we didn't have uniforms like Loretta Lynn's band or like, uh, you know, Ernest Tubbs' band, and everybody just wore their regular clothes, and it was like just a bunch of rock punks backing up this country singer, and it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and he was very different for his time, and... Uh, I, uh, he's in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, I believe, in Nashville, but he should be in the Country Music Hall of Fame, I think, you know, because he was, he was changing things, uh, you know, for everybody there. And, you know, a lot of people that are in the Hall of Fame didn't write the records that they had the hits with that they're in there for. He wrote them all. You know, I think there's two or three that, uh, that he didn't write. And everything else, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a, when you look at his repertoire, there's a lot more songs than you think other than Driving My Life Away, Love a Rainy Night, and uh, Just You and I, which he didn't write. But uh, I, I think he really deserves a lot more credit uh, than, he was, uh, than he was given. And uh, after that, I kicked around town. I worked with Exile for a while. The band uh, woke up in love. Uh, I worked with Exile for, well, I think, six months before they got sick of me. And then I was, I was gone from that. And uh, got a call from a friend and. Uh, uh, R.P. Harrell, that I'd uh, jammed with 25 years before in Houston, Texas with his band, and he remembered me. 25 years later, he knew that I'd worked with Eddie, and knew that I had a decent reputation. He called me and offered me the gig, and we'd been up here working in Branson with Eddie for, uh, oh, two or three years, and we couldn't stand it. You know, it was two shows a day. Two shows a day, are you kidding? And Eddie had records on the radio at the time, and we'd be playing to 125 people, 25 of them sleeping uh, during the show in the afternoon after lunch, you know, and Rabbit couldn't believe him. We'd get out there and they're, you know, and they're all in the chairs <laughs> snoring through Eddie's show, and you know, we're used to, you know, being out there for, yeah, you know, 5,000 people at that time maybe, but you know, adulation and all that, he wasn't getting that, and so we used to call Branson Doom with a View. And, <laughs> 
and, and the two the two show a day thing we we couldn't conceive it is what the two o'clock in the afternoon that doesn't make any sense you know and it didn't it still doesn't really you know although i'd like to have an afternoon show these days anyway rp and just to, not to digress rp called me and offered me the job at country tonight which i promptly turned down i said I'm doomed with a view to for the rest of my life. I said no. And I got back to Nashville about four days. He called me at Minneapolis when I was visiting some, some of my brother up there. And uh, I got back to Nashville four days later. Every gig I had fell up through. The band I was with broke up. My gigs on Broadway all dried up. And there I sat with my education uh, with no job. And I humbly, with hat in hand, called R.P. Harrell back and said, hey, man, uh, that thing still isn't open, is it? And he goes, yeah, it is, but I got a couple of guys coming into audition. And so I said, listen, can I have an audition? And he thought about it. He said, just come on up. The gig is yours. That's how much faith he had in me. And I, I'm appreciative of him and my buddy Wayne Massengale that uh, came through for me, vouching for me uh, through all of that. And went to work at Country Tonight, two shows a day, and took a show with the Bretts in the morning. I was working 600 shows a year in Doom with a View. And uh, I, I, don't th I think in two years I surpassed 20 years with Eddie. And we worked 1,200 shows in two years. I don't think I worked 12, uh, 1,200 shows with Eddie in 20 years. But anyway, um, uh, and I'm, st I'm working down there still with just about the same John and uh, RP. And, uh, and Clay Cooper. I work at Clay Cooper's Country Express now. Craig White back there worked with us for a couple of years, and he's a fine fellow. And my friend Ed Bungie down here, God bless him, with the drum shop here in town. Sadly, now defunct, but that's okay. A lot of great memories of working and coming into the shop and buying gear from Ed and all that. And uh, I came up, and uh, it's, it's the best move I could have made. At the time, I was 50 years old. I had 30 years in Nashville which to me is a career, you know, and there's not a better place to, I've got a house in Branson now and, and just one job, so I'm only working 185 shows a year now, <laughs> which uh, I think at the end, Eddie, was, we had a big year with 150 shows, I think, at the end of, the, of his career and everything, but uh, um, anecdotes, I got one I'd like to tell you all. It's, it's, it has to do with Bob Dylan, and uh, as, I, as I told you, my... My mother was friends with all the Jewish gals in town. Harriet Chez, Jimmy, 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 I'm going to get you a job with Bobby. I'm going to get you in there. Harriet, don't worry. Bobby doesn't know who I am. Not to worry about it. Well, we're in Sun City uh, not in uh, Arizona. Harriet calls me up. Jimmy, 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 I've got B.D. Zimmerman here, and she wants to come meet Eddie Rabbit, B.D. Zimmerman being Bob's mother whom my mother knew and my father both knew and everything. And I said, Harriet, he, he doesn't come down to, you know, do sound checks. We do sound checks ourselves. And she said, I'm, I'm coming over right now. Here she comes, dragging B.D. Zimmerman along, whom I'd never met. I'd never met Bob's mother. And she comes in, gives me a big hug, and starts talking about my father, who had been dead at the time for about 45 years, whom I didn't really know and starts telling me what a gentleman he was, this, that, and the other thing, and, and what a great fella. And I tell you what, it, it blew me away that she'd remember my dad like that and tell me things that I'd never heard about him and things like that. And she brought baba cake. Do you know what baba cake is? It's rum cake. Well, that disappeared in about two minutes after she brought that. And so, we, like I've told you before, we used to do a whole set of music. Well, one of the tunes that, uh, that I sang was Knocking on Heaven's Door. So I said, Beatty, sit down here and it was time for sound check and we got up and I sang knocking on heaven's door for Bob Dylan's mom so that was a that was an awesome day and she loved it and it was they just gotten back from Jerry Garcia Garcia's funeral she was uh, name dropping on me there and Jerry had just died and she and Bobby had been out to to uh, Marin or wherever it was at, uh, at Jerry's funeral and everything but uh, but the, the years in Branson have been good I work with great musicians down there and uh, it's a, it's a decent show and everything, and it, like I said, it, it couldn't have come at a better time for me uh, to come to this part of the world and go to work, you know, and uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a lot of fun. It's been a fun ride. Lucrative? Not really. <laughs> That's okay. It's been, uh, it's been a good life, and I wouldn't trade it uh, 
Like I said, my favorite quote is Charles Bukowski who said, uh, I've never met a man, another man that I'd rather be. And if that's a delusion, it's a lucky one. And, and I feel that same way, uh, that uh, there's, I, there's no better life I could have had than, than playing drums. And I appreciate you all having me here this afternoon. I really do. Thanks so much. Can I answer a question or two? Sure, everyone. Is, so much. Anybody got a question? Was, yeah. that, was that a rabbit? Is that his real name? Yeah. That was his real name. He was uh, Irish-American. His folks were from Ireland. His mother was from Ireland. And uh, I used to work uh, with his, his, naturally being a nice guy, I, I got stuck caring for his mom quite a bit. May, a rabbit, you know. And uh, Eddie and his mom didn't get along or see eye to eye all the time. But... Uh, in, uh, in Ireland, it's, it's spelled R-A-B-B-I-T-T-E, Rabbiti, it looks like. But that was his real name, Eddie Rabbit. And there was, a, there was another, I think a DJ in L.A. that was a country singer, Jimmy Rabbit, which I don't think is his real name. But Eddie, that was his real name. Very proud to be an Irish-American he was. Wrote a great song. If you ever want to listen to a great song, check out his Song of Ireland. It was one of my favorites. A really fine song. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, if you've ever known songwriters, you'll know that they're probably the laziest human beings that ever lived, <laughs> except when it comes to songwriting. They'll, you know, knock themselves out, spend, you know, eight, 12 hours at a time, sometimes in a writing session or something like that. I was talking to Merle Kilgore one time. Merle was, uh, he wrote Wolverton Mountain and Ring of Fire, and he managed uh, Hank Jr. for years. And he was about six foot nine, he's a great big huge guy. And he'd been married to June Carter before Johnny Cash. And uh, I was talking to Merle, and Eddie had roomed with Merle for a couple of years. And he looked down at me from way up high there in that mountain of a man that he was and said, I'll tell you what, brother, I knew Eddie Rabbit was gonna be a star. He never did a damn dish in his life. Apparently the place was a pigsty, but but Eddie carried a would you believe a grocery sack of cassette tapes at the time and uh, and had a huge book of ideas and lyrics that he would uh, that he would carry with him and little snippets of songs I don't know how he kept them all straight in his head somehow, but I wrote a tune with Eddie I did uh, one time I, I we wrote a song called uh, I'm There. And it's on his very last album, um, uh, ironically entitled Beating the Odds. It, when he, it was when he was sick uh, with cancer and everything. And we were sitting in the bus one night, and uh, I told him that I told him a story. I said, yeah, I told my buddy, hey, man, no more. I'm there. And uh, he said, you know, we need to write that. And that's the kind of guy he was. And we sat there down and wrote it in about... Two hours, I guess, we fleshed it out, and we came back and finished it up uh, the next day. That's how long it took, and he put it on, on his last, very last album. And I'm very proud of that piece. And uh, my name didn't get on it, and some of them, I have one of the copies of the CD that my name is on, so I can prove it if I have to. I've got evidence. <laughs> I've got corroboration. But uh, he, he would work, he had a little house uh, set aside for with the recording gear in it and stuff like that that he uh, would go out and work at, you know, get away from his family and stuff like that, and go out and just uh, and in a garret, like you would think of a writer or a poet, and go out there and compose. He was great friends with Chris Christopherson and told me the story of the day he walked in the door and Chris was been up all night on a bender and wrote, uh, and he says, hey, I got this new song I want to play for you, Eddie, saying, uh, help me make it through the night. So, I mean, you know, things like that. I mean, uh, Eddie was... Uh, you know, all these people are more than you think they are. Uh, they're more human than you think they are, basically. What Anybody else? Oh, my gosh. William Shatner. Uh, Eddie was a huge Star Trek fan. Unfortunately, for the first five years of our career, we had to travel on the same bus as Eddie. So you watch what the boss watches, which was Star Trek. And we'd be back in our bunks, and you could hear the things going, beep, 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 beep. You could hear those doors open on Star Trek, you know, while you're trying to sleep in your bunk, because he'd leave the TV on as he fell asleep, and it was always on a on an episode of Star Trek. And uh, so William Shatner, God bless him, would come out to this little gig we played in, 
as some of the crazy horse in Orange County, California. And Bill Shatner came out two or three times there and would hang out with Eddie. And I got his autograph one night, and I'm hanging out on the bus, and, and they're talking, you know. And as I'm, leaving, <laughs> as I'm leaving the bus, and you musicians in the audience will get this, I hear Shatner say to Eddie, Eddie, have you ever heard Rainy Night as a blues? <laughs> and if you've ever seen Shatner sing you, or heard him sing you, you know what I'm talking about. The only one worse than him was, uh, was Leonard Nimoy. He was, he was equally terrible. <laughs> anyway, that's a funny story. But uh, Bill Shatner would come on all the time and, and uh, catch the show. I got to meet Buddy Ebsen and Gene Hackman. And oh my God, the Pointer Sisters opened for us one time. My idols, the Pointers, opening for us. I could, like, what are we doing? You know, I, they sh we should be opening for them. They came out and just killed it every night. And we had to follow that. And, and because of the way the music business works, and he had hit records, it worked. You know, it's a shame. You know, it really is. But there they were. I mean, I listened to the Pointer Sisters till I was blue in the face as a kid. And uh, there they were opening for us in Las Vegas, you know. And like I said, Bette Midler, I got to meet Bette and all these different people. Like I said, Steve McQueen was really the capper, though. I couldn't believe that. What a, what a day that was. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What about your, the road, uh, Eddie's road band? Were the other members, uh, were they with him as long as you? I think at the, in the end, I'd been there the longest. I was there 20 years. The bass player had been there. Don had been there 16 or 17 years. The guitar player had been there 17 years. And the keyboard player was the new guy on the block. He'd been there 13 years. So, I mean, and it was, you know, Eddie's fortunes uh, towards the end of his career faded, you know, and uh, money was hard to come by and everything. But what I think, it, I'd like to believe that what kept us all together was it was a damn great band and it was fun music to play. Didn't he lose his steel player? He did, Ned Davis. Because I remember at the Branson show, he, he just... Uh, Ned was very sick uh, at the time and, uh, and yeah, and we were in Branson, as a matter of fact, at the Glen Campbell Theater at the time, which is now the Oak Ridge Boys. Theater and uh, and uh, Ned passed away finally uh, and everything. So we, we traveled as a as a quartet from that. It shook him up pretty bad. It did, yeah. And he was. Uh, and it was. Show was really flat. Yeah, it was. It was. It was not a good time. But I remember taking a, a sub bass player out one time, a friend of mine, to sub the gig, and uh, we, we, he was a great player, and we got through the gig fine. And he turned to me around and turned around to me and said, uh, at the end of the night, he said, "You know what? You guys play this show like it's the first time you've ever played it. Every time you play it." And I thought that was the highest compliment that could be paid to anybody to have that kind of energy still up after 17, 18 years. That was probably then that we've been at it, you know. And everybody always meant business, and Eddie had the good sense to hire great players. All the other guys. I mean, I feel fortunate. I learned so much. Uh, from all these other musicians, singing, playing, I mean, these guys were fabulous. It was a really a great band, and, uh, you know, and Eddie knew it too, uh, you know, and he, uh, he really appreciated all of us and everything, even though he didn't use, use us on the records, the swine, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, here's one more story, and I'll get off because I know you're ready to, to get out of here, but... Uh, but Don Barrett, the bass player, was probably one of the finest bass players I've ever worked with in my life, and I've worked with a lot of great players. Um, did, uh, he played on Rainy Night in the studio. That's where he and Eddie met. He played on Rainy Night and Driving My Life Away, uh, and Eddie's two biggest hits. Joined the road band, never played on another song that Eddie ever did again. That's the way the system in Nashville works. Uh, you know, it's it's a real strange kind of a, of a, of a thing, but that's Don had played on his two biggest hits, and after he joined the road band, there's some sort of stigma that goes along that road players aren't uh, good enough to be playing in the studio, which is, you know, unfortunately that's why everything sounds just like it does because you've got 50 guys out of 3,000, 4,000 players in Nashville, 50 guys, 60 stretching playing on every record out of Nashville. I'd say there's six drummers, five guitar players, four keyboard players maybe, and a, a few singers and fiddle players. 50 people, I'd say, are making 95% of the money 
in the recording sessions in Nashville, Tennessee, and I don't think I'm exaggerating there. I think that's about right. I can't think of over six drummers that are playing on sessions. Craig, I don't think you could either. You know, there's about six guys doing 95% of the work in the studios. And unfortunately, that's why everything sounds alike. And to me, that's coming out of Nashville. They're grinding it out, you know, and it's, there's no individualism or very little. And, you know, I mean, it just, uh, it, it all sounds the same to me. And I, of course, uh, in protest, quit listening to country music. So, anybody else? Thank you so much, folks. I appreciate it. Thanks.